Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and get this thing started. Um, my name is uh, Michael Kelly. Um, I'm a senior Rails dev, been doing this for, doing Rails for about five years. I've been a dev for on and off maybe 15 total. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as you can tell from, uh, from the slide in your program, um, we're gonna talk about Rails controllers today. Um, so before we get started, I know this is in the junior track. Um, let me see a show of hands. Who, who here is actually a junior developer? Somebody newer to the, the technologies? Okay, good, good. Um, how many people here are senior developers who are here to judge me on my presentation? <laughs> oh, good, okay, so I only have to impress a few of you. All right, good deal, good deal. <clears throat> so uh, I'm gonna start off, um, like I said, we're, we're talking about controllers. You've all seen them, you've all dealt with them in some way or the other. Uh, and a lot of times, what you see, especially for new developers, uh, coming out of boot camp or maybe some, you know, a, a, a run on tutorials online. And uh, the slides went away, so. <laughs> uh, that's me. I apologize for that. Um, okay, um, so we've all seen them. We've seen index actions, we've seen show actions. Uh, you've all seen the standard CRUD. Um, but what I'm kind of here to talk about is what actually happens out in the wild. Controllers you're gonna see when you step onto a new job or you know, pick up a new product, something like that. Um, and actually, the first slide I have is one such controller. No, you're not supposed to read that. We're not gonna go through that line by line, nothing like that. That's, that's atrocious. Um, that's over 350 lines of a single controller with over 18 different actions and 100 lines of just boilerplate code. That's wrong. If anybody's wondering, that's wrong. Um, what I wanna talk about a little bit is uh, how we get this nastiness out of what is essentially our standard controller, the one we've all seen. Uh, and it actually happens a lot, uh, a lot easier than you think it does. Um, <clears throat> so what, what we have here is, uh, is, is the standard. You have your index, show, new, create, all the standard actions. Um, but uh, a lot of the times what you'll hear people say is that uh, they, they blame controller bloat on things like rapidly changing requirements, um, uncontrolled feature growth, maybe changes in your team, or, or even in the worst case, where factors elsewhere in the app make you add things to your controller. Um, that's all wrong, every bit of it. Every time you read something like that, it's incorrect. Because that's not what happens. These are all controllable things. They exist in every business, every software product. These things happen, all right? There's a way to, uh, to maintain a good controller. So what actually causes this? How do we end up with 300 lines of garbage? Well, main thing is, is it's a misunderstanding about what your actions are actually doing, what resources they're actually working on. <clears throat> so I, I, want to, uh, I want to walk us through a, a small example. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit closer to real world, uh, but I've, I've glossed over a few things for, for time here. Um, so we're gonna take, for example, and this is actually something I, I've done a few times. Um, let's say you're working somewhere and uh, your company is in charge of running ads for its clients on Facebook, Twitter, any of these social platforms, okay? So the fairly standard requirements that you'll see uh, you need a way to uh, kind of browse, edit, and deal with the ads, create them, edit them, things of that nature. Um, we also have to have a way to control those ads, uh, pause them, activate them, uh, basic on-off style features. Um, and the last, uh, users have to be able to see the performance of their ads, see how many people are seeing them, see who clicks them, how many times they've been clicked, what the impressions are. Um, 
so in this example, I, I'm not gonna build a, a, a whole app. Um, I'm only gonna deal with one controller. Um, call this the, the ads controller. So the first thing we do, we come in, okay, we have an ad object somewhere, and we wanna be able to do the standard CRUD operations, or, or you'll see there, I, I actually prefer the term bread um, because it includes the index. That's browse, read, edit, add, and delete. That's just a, a nomenclature thing, and I'm weird that way. Um, so you saw this before. This is just re-implemented um, in this context as an ads controller. Pretty straightforward. Um, I don't even have any features in there like uh, paging or search or anything like that. Just straightforward um, actions. Um, so we've implemented this, we've pushed it to production, uh, and everything's fine. Um, but the next thing, well, I'm sorry. Uh, so we have uh, a total of seven actions out of the gate, okay? Every controller has these, or, or most do. Um, so we're already talking about something that has seven different contexts that you have to keep mentally. But, like I said before, we have to control these ads. And we want to be able to do that in a, in a nifty kind of way, maybe some JavaScript button on the front end. Um, we click it, and it makes some uh, Ajax call to our, uh, our app and pauses an ad. So we come in, and, and this is something you'll see a lot of times. Uh, I, I won't say naive, but um, you know, eager developers will take these actions and go, okay, well, they're Ajax actions. Let's just stick them in the ads controller. That's what we're dealing with, right? All right, so this is that same controller with those actions added. Uh, and don't worry if, uh, if you can't read the code that's on the screen there. I actually want you to keep, uh, just kind of keep a mental model of how, how that controller is shaped and how, how much information is there, okay? We're not looking at specific implementation today. But you see there, our action count has ballooned up to 10. All right, so that's now 10 different contexts, 10 different ways this controller can be used. Now, that's great. You know, we have these, these three new actions that maybe kick off a background job uh, that talks to Facebook or Twitter, or something like that. Then one of your execs walks in, and uh, this is a phrase I've literally heard multiple times. Um, so we want more of a responsive UI. We want uh, some way that uh, our page can load and then load individual visuals for our ads asynchronously. So we come back over here to our trusty ads controller, and uh, maybe we, uh, we need a, a pane to preview the ad so the user can, can see what it'll look like on Facebook. Um, maybe there's, uh, we want some little widget that'll show them generic stats in a, like a list of their ads, something of that nature. So we come in, we add two more actions. Now, these actions, I don't know if you can see it there, but all they do is render out a partial something for Ajax to process and insert into the page. Again, our action counts back up to 12. <clears throat> so the controller doesn't look so bad. Um, now, I'll, I'll let you know, each one of those actions is as minimally implemented as possible. Um, the rendering the partials is a single line. Uh, the background jobs are a single line. Um, so any logic added here is only going to complicate the matter. Oh wait, <laughs> now, we have to be able to deal with our stats, our statistics about these ads. So once again, we come back. Let's say we want a page that'll show our, uh, the audience, the people who have clicked our ads. These are people who have interacted with our ad and we wanna maintain a list of those. Um, and maybe we want a dashboard to kind of see how uh, I as a user am performing in general. So we come back and we add a few more actions. Uh, and these, these actually deal with maybe some helper objects to do some calculation. Um, maybe there's uh, some aggregation or uh, processing that goes on in this data. Um, and here we are, now we're up to 14. Now, I, I don't know if, I don't remember if I mentioned it, but that original controller I showed you only had 17 actions. So we're not that far off. Um, and you can see how, uh, again, if any kind of logic gets inserted into these actions, if you add any if-else blocks, if you add any escape statements, anything, uh, anything directly in these actions, all you're gonna do is turn it back into that. 
Okay, so we're not that far off. It's actually pretty easy, and it, it happens without you thinking about it. You know, you're thinking about that one feature, adding a preview or adding a statistics page, um, not your controller as a whole. So the answer to this, uh, to keep yourself from getting out of control like that, is to break it up. Break your controllers up into pieces. Um, now, I've, uh, I've talked to a couple of junior developers before uh, about this topic directly, and a lot of times people will have trouble breaking the context. You know, in every one of those actions, we were dealing with ads. So it makes sense mentally to, to stick in the ads controller. Um, but what I, uh, what I argue is we're not actually dealing with ads in all those actions. So to, to kind of help you out a little bit, um, these are some different ways you can think about uh, what kinds of controllers you're going to, to build. Um, so in that, uh, in that example, we had uh, actions that dealt with uh, static or, or view layer data. This is uh, processing a partial or uh, dealing with maybe a static page that's a landing page, things of that nature. We had actions that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, dealt with things that are composite concepts, uh, concepts that aren't mirrored directly by like an active record model or, or something of that nature. Um, and then uh, finally there, we have aggregate actions, things that collect a bunch of data together and pipe it down to the front end. Um, so let's take that example. Um, we're actually gonna break it up along these lines. So, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at your static control, your, your uh, static and view uh, style actions, these are those same actions from that previous controller. You can actually read those now. That's, that's a font you can read again. Um, these are the preview and stats actions. Um, I've separated them out and I've stuck them in a different controller because what you're dealing with here is a view of an ad, not an ad itself, okay? That's a different resource, a different, quote, model that you're dealing with. You see the same thing over here with your composite controllers. Um, now these are things uh, you'll see a lot of times, Devise is actually a good example of this. Um, if any of you have used Devise for authentication or, or authorization, anything like that, um, there's all sorts of session controllers that you can override and add your own functionality. And nobody that I know of has ever built a session model in a Rails app. Um, or like, a, like in this example, jobs. So those, uh, those Ajax actions that would pause and activate your ads, actually what we're doing is we're starting a job on the back end, starting something that's gonna call out to Facebook, tell it to pause a specific ad. So I've broken those up as well into this ads jobs controller, or ad jobs controller, um, because that's what we're dealing with is jobs, not ads. Uh, and the same thing goes for aggregate data, our audiences, that's something that's pulled from every ad we have. Uh, the dashboard, that pulls in information about every ad we have. So it's, a, uh, it's an aggregate resource. It's not a single model. <clears throat> and then of course, we have our standard uh, CRUD controller with the index show, create, add, delete, blah, blah, blah. So <clears throat> what we've done uh, is, uh, is separate all these pieces out into different, different controllers. Um, and in, it's not immediately obvious what the benefits to doing something like this are, um, but one, it's easier to debug your controllers. It's easier to navigate them mentally because if you have a problem with, say, the previews that we talked about a minute ago, uh, maybe we need to render them differently or something about that is breaking, well, we know right where to go, and there's two actions in that controller. So we can make those edits without having to build the entire mental context of that ads controller that we talked about earlier. The other is, uh, and, and you'll see this a lot when you step out into the real world, um, learning and onboarding. This is one of the toughest things that a developer does, and that's step into a new application. Um, so when, uh, when you're learning uh, a new app, do you think it's easier to 
take 350 lines and dig out the bit, the maybe two lines you need to deal with, or two lines you need to learn how a specific action works. It's a lot harder when you have to dig through that big giant mess we saw a minute ago. The other is uh, you, you localize your changes, and this is this is something that uh, a lot of people talk about encapsulation, um, you know, uh, separation of concerns and whatnot. But ultimately, like I said before, if you're dealing with, say, stats, you need to calculate something differently, um, your changes are going to occur in that controller, not in one big giant mess. So if you go and you add, say, a before action, you now want to, I don't know, authenticate this call or uh, do some object setup before the action comes in. Uh, if you've got 20 different actions in that controller, you now have to explicitly control which actions that filter is called on. You know, do a you know, before action, accept all these others, or only these two. Um, so now when you make a change, it only affects the pieces of functionality that you want it to. And the last here, um, this is one that, uh, that uh, I haven't seen talked about quite a lot, and that's that it's actually easier to coordinate uh, working on a larger team. If you've got multiple people working on this code base, Maybe you're working on uh, improving statistics, adding uh, more information and data there, and you over here, you're working on uh, making the previews look slicker, look cooler. Um, maybe you over there, you're working on uh, you know, improving, uh, maybe there's some business logic we need to add to creating an ad, some kind of check we need to include. We can do that now. You're not all making changes to a single file that then conflicts when you go to merge it in. <clears throat> so uh, I kind of blasted through that a little bit faster than I expected, but um, the, the main things I want you to take away from this talk um, are uh, that you need to actually look at actually what your actions are dealing with, okay? You're not, they're not all dealing with an ad resource or a product resource or a user resource. These are different conceptual ideas that it's dealing with. Um, and your controllers, I, I want to see a lot of controllers, OK? I don't want to see big, giant ones. I don't want to see um, 300 lines with 20 different actions. In fact, I actually challenge you that, uh, that controller we saw in the beginning, the standard CRUD controller, make that the most complicated controller you have, the one you see in the tutorials, the one you see online in the perfect examples. Make that the most complicated controller you have. It's, it's challenging, it can be, um, but ultimately, that was the most complicated one I showed you, uh, outside of the, the trashy controller. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the main point here, like I said, um, and, and you'll see I actually had a couple people ask me um, how this relates to RESTful design um, which is a, a fun buzzword in our world. Um, and I, uh, I make the argument that this is RESTful. To, to create a REST resource, a, an object that can be created, that can be destroyed, that can be changed, you have to actually define what that object is. Uh, and it's not, I promise you, it's not the same as all your other actions. Dig in and take a look at that. <clears throat> um, so I've, I've gone way under time here, um, but uh, <laughs> I, I think I over-caffeinated. Um, but uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, I would love to go back through and, and, and talk about it in more detail. The, the question was uh, if I have any examples of where it's you know, permissible or, or okay to add uh, some actions on top of those standard CRUD actions. Um, and in some cases, it can be. I mean, as developers, we kind of play a balancing act um, between the right way and the achievable way. Um, you know, if you, if you have a feature going out or it needs to be in production in 20 minutes or a fix that needs to be in production very quickly, it can be very hard to do a refactor into three different controllers and test all of those controllers and push them up, get them reviewed, the whole nine yards. Um, and so what you'll see is a lot of times earlier on in, uh, 
um, in a project, um, it's, uh, it's very convenient to add small actions like, like that, like uh, possibly the Ajax actions or maybe the view actions. Um, and and it's, it's all right early on. You know, if you have a total of maybe three controllers and you want to tack some small functionality on there, that's fine. Get it in there, get it pushed out. Not a big deal. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the main thing, though, is, is understanding when you introduce a new concept. Um, so for instance, if I, uh, the previews that I mentioned, if, uh, um, if that was a very small feature early on, yeah, we'll stick that in the ads controller, not a big deal. Um, but if this is a, a, a concept that you are approaching in the app a lot, um, you're gonna come back to it with previews and maybe some stats widget or uh, you know, further widgets along those lines. If this is something that's going to keep happening, separate it out. You know, don't, don't just tack it on there extra because um, it will grow uncontrollably. Um, actually build like an API namespace and um, that's, I'm sorry, the question was, uh, so with the, like the ads previews where you're rendering out partials, um, after you've created a few of those, uh, it starts to appear like a kind of a private API. You know, your, your front end app or your front end page is uh, making these, uh, these private calls to get these these partials, uh, and at what point do you look to refactor that to say like a slash API namespace? Um, and again, just like everything else, it's, it's a lot of judgment calls, um, but uh, it, it tends to, a decision like that um, tends to matter more when you foresee, it's a little bit about looking to the future. So if you know, you're, you're writing your first couple that, that render a partial, um, and then you know, a few more are coming along. Maybe you're even dealing with uh, some, some JSON elements, you know, uh, serializing your, your objects in a certain way. Um, really, it comes down to when an abstraction like that, uh, excuse me, when the, uh, the elements you're adding justify the work necessary for the abstraction. Um, and you'll see a lot of times, it, it's, it's an interesting balancing act uh, because um, like I'll, I'll jump into an app uh, like that and you know, I've done that so many times creating you know, this internal API that, that I can crank that out in a few minutes. So the level of difficulty is different based on the developer who's, who's picking it up. Um, if you've ever dealt with <clears throat> agile development, you've, you've estimated that way. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, it kind of depends on uh, the velocity moving forward, you know, where you're headed. Um, and, and to, to kind of further your question a little bit, at what point does that stop being an API embedded in your app and a dedicated API launched at a different URL? You know, that's, those, those levels of abstraction in the app itself um, really kind of depend on uh, where you see the app going. Um, from a design perspective, from an architecture perspective. Um, and it's, that's something that I, to this day, still get into arguments with my own team about. You know, I'm like, hey, let's go ahead and abstract this thing up there. And so I'm like, oh, it's not worth it. It's not worth it right now. Um, and you, know, you make the debate back and forth, and ultimately, you know, when, when you can go to your team and say, hey, I'm gonna create this API, and they go, hey, okay. You know, when you all kind of come to that same decision, it's time. It, it does, it does, and uh, I, did, did everybody hear that, that question? Um, uh, so it, his question was, um, in, in a lot of the designs that he's dealing with, um, are the, the designers you know, don't, don't follow RESTful. They, they, you know, they view the design of an app and how users are gonna interact with it. Um, and that's, that's actually the crux of my point here is that designers don't deal with controllers. Designers will never deal with a controller. Um, the controller is your side of that. So in that situation, um, I, would, I would make the effort to, to maintain the separation, you know, a, a customer's controller, a, I'm sorry, a questions controller, a student controller, um, and then leverage your front end to combine that data if necessary, um, whether that's through Ajax or something of that nature. Now, if it's extremely heavy, um, so you have lots and lots of places that these two objects are, are rendered or, or serialized together, um, then 
you start to think, start to look at it more like a uh, a composite resource, kind of like I mentioned earlier. Um, so if you're always rendering those together, then create a controller that encapsulates that concept. You know, this is a, I, I'm not sure what your context is, but um, call this a student questions controller, and it renders them out as a, um, a, a grouping of that data. Uh, that, the decision to go one way or the other on that tends to go, it tends to matter more how much you're doing it, how closely tied they are consistently throughout the app. Um, but I, I tend to, uh, designers don't like me um, because uh, I tend to uh, force my code into a good design um, and you know, it'll add a little bit of work to, to kind of converge it on the front end. Um, but in, in my mind, the benefits of, of uh, ease of development um, and, and localized changes really outweigh that. Because a lot of times, uh, if those two things are rendered together uh, at the same time, a lot of the changes you want to, say, the logic associated to creating a student or viewing them uh, will uh, apply to the student itself, um, regardless of if it's rendered together or separately, uh, in which case you want that separated into its own controller. Um, so a lot of times it's, it can be hard, especially in a meeting room, but you know, your code is, is your code. The designer's design is their design, and, and there has to be a line of separation there. You know, what I'm gonna implement will achieve that design, but I'm gonna do it in my way so that my code is still understandable, still maintainable. Um, otherwise, you're gonna get into fights with them later on when you can't change something to the way they want it because you've kind of locked into this, this uh, marriage of the two resources. <laughs> Favorite Zen philosopher. Uh, well, considering I stole the title from Robert Persig and uh, his Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, um, I'd have to say him. <laughs> um, it's, it's a lot of the same concept, though. It's about um, looking, at, looking at what's in front of you and, and kind of seeing it from both the, the functional and the aesthetic perspective. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I said don't try and read the code, just look at the file as a whole. You'd be surprised how much an eye for aesthetics on your code will actually do for it functionally um, and vice versa. You know, as, as long as you kind of apply a, uh, a much more whole mindset to it. All right, well, I am, uh, I'm now out of time. I managed to kill the rest of that. Um, thank you guys very much. I, uh, I really appreciate it.